you have to identify the problems that you're having first well before you ever think of technology. Welcome to Go to Market Excellence. We are here with Brad Smith, and uh, we're thrilled to have him. He's the co-founder and CEO of Sonar, an Atlanta-based software company that provides a single source of truth uh, and visibility, so that operations professionals and admins can manage their tech stack with confidence and clarity. Brad is also the founder of Wizard of Ops, a fast-growing Slack community of over 2,500 RevOps professionals who share advice, challenges and memes about the world of ops. Uh, a bunch of people from my company are in Wizard of Ops and uh, absolutely love it. And uh, we're actually uh, customers of Sonar, so um, super glad to have Brad on the podcast. Brad, welcome to the show. Dan, thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. So your path is incredibly cool. You're certainly the first person that I've met who went from director of RevOps to straight to CEO. You know, we often see founders are former engineers or uh, they come up through the, C through the finance track or through the marketing track, and they were former CFOs or CMOs. But uh, rarely do we run into people who went from RevOps to CEO. So would love to hear your perspective on how leading a RevOps function uniquely prepared you for leading a company. Yeah, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't say uh, working with some of the great companies and great leaders that I've worked with in the past, uh, by all means, has helped me get to where, where I am, especially uh, get Sonar to where we are today. But I think on the RevOps perspective of it, being unique to other founders, I think you kind of have to take a look at a lot of companies and how they start, um, who they start with. A lot of folks are starting companies that are particular to one silo. So you, you typically see uh, an engineering or computer science focused um, founder or co-founder most of the time, or a just business, uh, a business relevant uh, focused person thinking of uh, sales or, or marketing for that matter. And so they've always had you know, their perspective of one specific silo of an organization or one specific um, department and how it should run. But a lot of times they don't know some of the other ins and outs of all the other departments. I think one of the kind of unique and cool things to uh, the RevOps world that we live in now is that obviously we're, we're not just supporting one silo, we're supporting many. So you get to have this perspective and you get to have this understanding of what marketing looks like. We'll start at the top of the funnel, right? What, what does marketing look like? What operationally drives them or the metrics that, that really make them um, successful as a, as a business entity or, or department within a company go down to sales. You get to see how sales works and how even things, like small tweaks to, to small things inside of businesses make huge impacts, keep going down, customer success, finance, even all the way down to supporting some of the HR and, and billing side of things. I, I look back at, at my career. I've, I've had the fortunate opportunity to work in one, a couple of fantastic and very successful companies, but two, getting to help support those groups, right? And I think the RevOps mindset of making decisions uh, sort of agnostic to one department's benefit or gain and really removing all that bias is extremely helpful uh, when you're going to start a company. I can look very tactically and see what efforts my marketing department is doing or our marketing efforts are doing and how do they impact sales. How do those same sales pieces impact uh, customer success and so on? Uh, and I think a lot of it comes down to not seeing it for the first time. So it's, uh, yeah, did I draw it up that way? Did I say, you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was trying to think of what my career looked like? I'm going to go into RevOps because then I'm going to go start a company. Absolutely <laughs> not. But uh, I guess very serendipitous of it to, to turn out the way it did. Super fascinating. And I think, you know, your, your uh, view as a leader of RevOps, it was at Terminus, correct? Yeah, so your view there was across the whole uh, spectrum of the organization. And uh, so you get to uh, work with everybody just like you do as CEO, but you also have are getting, uh, you know, just like in RevOps, and you are as a CEO getting attacked from all angles to solve problems and, and things like that. So, so how uh, did you feel like your uh, position in a, as a RevOps leader and taking, uh, you know, quick turnaround projects and uh, emergency requests from sales and things like that? Did you feel like that... Uh, prepared you for the um, the challenges and the stress levels of, of being as chief executive? Absolutely. I think the one thing that, that you'll quickly find in, in companies like ours and, and a lot of the, the customers that, that you and I both support 
um, from from small, medium, large enterprise, however they are, there's so many moving parts to a business. And I think the one thing to always keep in mind, and this is such a parallel to the RevOps you know, sort of framework, is that even in most companies, it's kind of uncommon for marketing to totally know what engineering's up to, right? Like mm-hmm. those are those are very far spread apart departments. Not too much work overlap. You don't you don't see a lot of concentric circles with, with marketing and engineering really collaborating. But in 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 our perspective of it, especially on a RevOps world, you're, if you're supporting all these different groups that might not be talking to each other, you have to be that central um, that central uh, glue. Really, it's glue. That. Glue, yes, yeah. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, you have to be the glue that holds that together. I was going to start going down like a translation route of like you have to be that one central place <laughs> where you take the business requirements for marketing. And honestly, you got to go talk to engineers, not necessarily the marketing hat on sometimes, but with an engineer, engineering hat on, mm-hmm. vice versa. Customer success might not have too, too much to do with finance, but if you know what helps both of them drive each other and the overall outcome of the business, yeah, absolutely, it, it's beneficial. So um, I think to to answer your, your question directly, you, you do get attacked from all angles. That's you, you talk to anybody in the RevOps world, and a lot of the folks are going to be listening to this podcast are going to say the exact same thing. A, a lot of times, the left hand doesn't always know what the right hand's doing. Sometimes you have to tell it. And from a, I think one of the under undervalued traits of a really, really, really good RevOps uh, resource or RevOps leader is their ability to communicate. If mm-hmm. you're an effective communicator, if you're able to help your entire organization, whether that's just sales marketing and success in a RevOps framework or you know from an executive level leading an entire company, everyone should know and you should be able to help communicate across the entire business what the what the marching orders are, what the what the directive of the company is. Yeah. You may be uh I, I have a, I'm gonna just make a prediction here on go to market excellence that you are <laughs> paving the way of pioneering a new path to the uh to the CEO level straight from the RevOps. So I I, th- I could see it happening in a very short order over the next few years. Um, so one of the, one of the things we talked about before, you know, in a previous conversation we had was that companies often, especially growth stage, early startups, early and growth stage startups, they often, uh, fall into this mode of feeling like they have to make a bunch of technology purchases and they have to keep purchasing new technology. The bigger they grow, the more people they have. I know that's something that's, um, you're particularly interested in um, fighting against that notion but uh talk to me about that and uh, because obviously you're you know RevOps is central to technology purchases especially sales tech and martech but now that you're ceo how have you tried to um uh, change the paradigm of how technology is bought at sonar and um, perhaps other companies that you have influence on yeah um Funny enough, some of the opportunities I get to to join uh, podcasts and webinars and speaking engagements, a lot are centered around how go-to-market technology is evolving, what companies should be using this versus that. Uh, and I, I kind of always hit a safe harbor statement at the very beginning of most of them. It's like if, if you jumped on this podcast or jumped on this webinar to say to hopefully hear a, a nugget of, ooh, Brad's going to tell me to buy outreach and not sales loft or sales loft and not outreach or you know, this version versus that. Um, there's a good chance you're not going to hear that. And it's not because, um, you know, the, the political battlefield that, that is involved with it, it's more so you have to identify the problems that you're having first well before you ever think of technology. I think one of the kind of strange parts about this RevOps revolution and, and the way that we're seeing to build is we have so many different folks that have great thought leadership of here's how I'm building my team, here's how I'm building my tech stack, here's how I'm building all this other uh, other pieces of infrastructure. And I think a lot of folks will see success from one of those companies like, oh, well, that company is using that software. I need to use that too. Um, and to a certain degree, you know, market leaders should be thought of as that. But I always tell folks when they're asking me like, hey, hey, Brad, what should I buy for this? Like, you're asking the wrong question first. You should be like, hey, Brad, I've got this problem. How do you think about solving it? And if you really think about solving a problem well before you think about a logo or an invoice you're going to get to pay for it, you're going to do yourself such a better favor because you're going to be able to go into that conversation and that evaluation cycle knowing what you're looking for. Spoiler alert, sales reps are really, really good at selling. They're really good at value, showing value, lead with value, show the value prop of our our service or of our product. But um, they're doing their job. You should do yours as a buyer and understand what your pain points are. Um, Mm -hmm. One of 
one of the best things you mentioned was ops earlier. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. you'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to one of our yeah. members there, Scott, Scott Haney over at Chili Piper shared a document with me a long time ago. And I've known Scott for years um, as he's evaluating software and what they do, Nicholas and the whole team at, at Chili Piper do, they have a document for it. And, and we actually have this one pager now that we share with a lot of our customers too. When you're buying software, ask these questions. And mm-hmm. honestly, is it this pain point? Are you solving it with this? What does the expectation look like when that problem gets solved? And objectively, if you're scoring it that way, it's going to help you buy software. But there's this underlying benefit, even as the software providers, you know, as the sellers themselves. If you're able to set your customer up for success with that, you know how much easier you just made it for customer success. You just wrote what they want, how we need to deliver, and what we what their expectation is of us. This should be a no-brainer 365 days from now when we're having renewal conversations. When yeah. yes, you told us that here was your problem, and look, we solved them. Let's let's keep solving problems together. Let's keep the relationship going. So, and on the yeah, flip to, side, yeah, and on the flip side, it saves sellers a bunch of time if they can quickly um, decide that it's not a good fit. You know. Oh yeah, you you ask any one of our anybody on our sales team, they're going to tell you, man, I'd much rather know very quickly if they're going to say no. I don't know on the first call than the 80th. So. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, so one, uh, one thing you brought up is, uh, you said, you know, companies are so worried about getting all these, uh, tech, lo- if they see a high performing company that's getting a lot of press and they just bought a certain technology, then they want to go buy that technology to keep up almost the keeping up with the Joneses mentality. A- any particular examples that come to mind, um, that, uh, that you want to, you don't have to name drop a brand or anything, but it would be great if you did. Yeah, well, no, I mean, uh, I mean, there's there's a ton out there. I think one of the cool things that we're seeing a lot of, and I'll say this on the RevOps space just in general, um, mm-hmm. because it's a new way of thinking, it's a new way of structuring your your business, a new way of structuring your operational resources. People are hungry for uh, for content, and you look at some of them. I'll name drop these. You think of some of the best content providers out there. I mean, look at what HubSpot's uh, doing. They've always been a great producer of content. Uh, our friends over at Gong, like I, I uh-huh. love reading through all of their content pieces, um, and a lot of it's very objective into go how, into how to go solve a problem, not objective into this software is better than this one. But you know, I, I look at folks like that that put out great content, and that's what, exactly what we're work, working on as well here is to educate our customers. The, the better our customers are educated, the more it, it's a little bit of a rising tides uh, mentality. Uh-huh. The more you're able to push your name and your brand and the way that you think about uh, solving problems to the market, the more highly thought of you are going to be thought of when they go through evaluations. It's like, no, 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 these people know what they're talking about. Here's all the different case studies, all the different use cases and customer interviews that they've done with folks. Yeah. Yeah. I gotcha for sure. Um, and I do want to get into the, what you guys have been talking about on the content side, but one more question on um, your perspective as a CEO before we get into that. Uh, and that is, so we, you know, I'm going to ask a slightly different question than I asked when we started, which was how did RevOps prepare you to lead the company? This one is, um, what do most other CEOs overlook that because of your unique background, you put a huge emphasis on? Yeah. Um, you know, I a hundred percent have to say culture and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the way that we've grown even this year, um, you know, earlier this year, we were still around you know, between 10 and 15 headcount. We're close mm-hmm. to 50 now. Um, wow. one of those things that every high growth company goes through is staffing and bringing new folks on and culture is one of those things that you have to double down on. Uh, again, fortunately I've been in so many great companies that have had thriving, amazing cultures. I've also been in some that haven't, and there's a difference and it's a difference in how you wake up every day. It's a difference in how you get to the office and you get to see the people that you work with. Hopefully you identify them as friends and not just coworkers. That's hopefully building signs of building a good culture as well. Um, but I mean, here's the harsh reality of it from a, a business owner perspective. You spend a lot of money on your people, close to 80% of all of your dollars that you spend or that you uh, yeah, spend on a, on a monthly and quarterly basis are on your people with payroll and benefits and everything else that's involved. And so you should be focusing just the same amount of time on making sure that you're building a, a thriving culture. Um, every time we're onboarding new folks here, we, we have a founder session in that first week and we tell the founding story. Why did we start the company? What problems are we solving for? What problems are you here to help us solve next? Um, mm. You're just as important to this as we are. And I've told everyone here so far, again, in, in these first 50 employees, um, you know, Jack and I might be co-founders, but you and everyone here at this point, at this stage of our company are cultural co-founders. 
uh, you have an obligation to build an amazing company and build an amazing thriving culture the same way that I have an amazing uh, opportunity to go build an entire company. So, but, but we both have this obligation to build these things the right way. And so, you know, you, you think about it in that context, I think every early, every early stage executive and founder and co-founder CEO goes through it. Um, but it's one of those things that, you know, you, you have to sometimes slow down a little bit, ask a lot of questions. Hey, you guys still having fun? Anything we can do to make yeah. this more fun? You know, work's tough, life's tough, but we need to be having fun, being high energy here, which is one of the big things about, you know, our, our culture that we drive. And it truly does help get people in and get them excited and um, bring on great talent as well. So, yeah, culture is one of those things that I was told early from a couple of other uh, you know, former bosses and now advisors to our company, don't take your eye off of it. Um, if uh, it slips, it's so hard to regain. Yeah, I love that. And I love the the uh, question or the what you propose to your new, uh, new employees coming in that – um, uh, you know, these are the problems we've solved in the past. And these are the ones you're bring. we brought you on to come help solve. And, uh, that's such a good frame of mind to come in with. Uh, and, and I'm just curious, like, what are the other uh, things that Sonar has figured out, you know, in your first 50 employees, what have you guys figured out about culture that most other companies struggle to figure out that early? Um, I think there's one innate ability that Jack and I both try to instill with everyone is just say thank you. <laughs> like it's not, mm-hmm. it's not that hard, but we, we all sometimes sadly forget to do it. And we, uh, we internally, we have a, a an internal award called the Periscope award. You know, our, our logo is a submarine, right? And the whole like premise mm-hmm. of it is the, uh, if you're on a submarine and you're actually, you know, you know, half mile underwater, you can't see anything. There's one person in charge of the entire boat to make sure that the safety is involved of it. They're manning the periscope and they're looking through there. Their job is to make sure there's no bombs in front of us or anything else that we could run into. Um, and so we give it on a monthly basis. We give our periscope award out to the employee that has essentially the most shout outs. So we have a Slack channel called shout out. Uh, you can go and nominate people there for this award. Tell them, you know, tell us something as to you know, what core value did they exemplify and why are you nominating them? Uh, we tally them all up. We tell them at the end of each month who's the award winner. Uh, we actually give them a, a small prize. They get a, a, a extra hundred dollar bonus, and then they also get to pick a charity of their choice that we donate a hundred dollars on their behalf of. And again, it all boils back down to like, just say thank you. It's not that hard. We're all working really hard, and when somebody helps you out, um, if somebody does team over self, which is one of our core values. Mm-hmm. You know, give them a shout out, jump over there, tell them like, Hey, thank you for doing that. You know, really appreciate you exemplifying our core values. And it's not crazy. It's not rocket science, but it's, it's still people oriented. Um, you know, we're, we're not all robots yet, so we, we shouldn't act as such. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I love that. The Periscope award. Um, uh, yeah. So if you're listening to this and you're thinking about a way to, uh, get people more, I guess, c- communicating more over Slack and more get, get the shout out culture going get your own Periscope scope award um, launched at your company. That's the takeaway for me, at least. Uh, let's Absolutely. let's switch gears, Brad. I want to, I, um, you mentioned earlier that you guys pr- are producing a lot of content. You want to be the uh, educational, uh, hate to use the word thought leader because it's so overused, but you want to be the leading voice for uh, something. And I think that something is change intelligence based on what I've read in on your website. Tell us about change intelligence and uh, why you think it's so critical for companies, especially the gross, the tech companies that you guys serve. Yeah. So candidly, I think you learn most from your mistakes. And I think I look back over the you know, last five, 10 years of my career, I, I probably wasn't making the most intelligent changes when it comes to tech stack management. Um, and look, let's, let's boil it down and understand exactly what, what we're solving for, who we're solving it for, especially. Um, you know, the folks that are responsible for managing go-to-market tech stacks in, in some of these high-growth companies, but also we're, we're industry agnostic. doesn't have to be a high-growth company. We've got healthcare companies, we have manufacturing, um, you know, all across the board. And when we look at what a go-to-market tech stack looks like, a couple of years ago, it might have been three or four different pieces of technology. You look at it today and it's 15 to 20, uh, 30 to 40, 50 plus, depending on you know, how big mm-hmm. your company is, how many resources you have. And there are parts to it that are hard to change. It, it just sounds kind of silly and a, a little elementary to say, but even if you're just going and making a change in Salesforce, how is that going to react in my marketing automation platform? Or how is that going, is that change going to impact my 
um, sales intelligence or sales engagement platform? Maybe, maybe not. But what we found and, and what I've found personally, just through my experience of managing this is a lot of times we're flying blindfolded. Uh, hence some of the, the sonar uh, perspective of it and why we picked that logo, why we picked that brand. Um, you need to be able to send a signal out, understand if there's a bomb in front of you, let that signal come back to you and hopefully it tells you to, to veer left instead of right. Um, you know, there's a whole reason why we had that as our logo. But you know, a lot of folks, there's another analogy we use often that's you know, building a house or making an update to your house even. Um, you know, if you're going to go and add a new bedroom onto your house, the last thing you're going to go do is knock that wall out before taking a look at the blueprint to make sure there's not some plumbing behind there, some electrical behind there. And so these are all just examples of making intelligent decisions, making intelligent changes. Now, you factor that philosophy in or that kind of mindset in with the number and sheer volume of changes you have to make to a go-to-market tech stack to enable your go-to-market teams to do their jobs the right way. Um, you know, the numbers don't lie. We, we, part of our software, we can track the number of changes you're making on a daily, oh, really? weekly, wow. monthly basis. So yeah, and you'd, you'd be shocked because I, I think one of the things that, that really resonates with a lot of our users and a lot of folks that we're solving this tactically for is that they know how many changes they're making or they feel the impact of it. But a lot of the folks that are requesting it, some of their VPs of sales, CROs, CMOs, CEOs, even, um, they don't know the level of effort that goes into making that one little automation in Salesforce do the right thing. And so we're able to help display what that level of effort looks like. But again, ultimately, like you said earlier, make these changes in a more intelligent fashion with less risk, with higher clarity and confidence, therefore making them more efficiently, which the name of the game is efficiency. If, if you as an operations team are running efficiently, so are your go-to-market teams. Mm -hmm. Let's drill down on the changes you're referring to. So um, I think I can Im imagine some of them, but uh, f for the benefit of everyone here, what are some of the most common changes you you've seen and, and maybe a couple of examples of ones that often don't go the way, the way that, that we want them to and, and cause a whole bunch of problems. Absolutely. I'll, I'll start with the sales teams first because they feel they feel this impact almost as much as anybody. But, yeah. um, you know, I'm not going to go full Salesforce tutorial, but you operate your sales opportunities on opportunity stage. You know, things like stage one, stage two, mm -hmm. stage three, stage four, as you run through your your pipeline. There's plenty of times where a very small change that could be using that specific field opportunity stage, you're going to put a new validation rule in place. That way, if you mark the opportunity as closed loss before you save it, we're going to ask you, why did this opportunity not close? Was it because of a competitor? Was it because of timing budget? We all know what the usual, uh, usual suspects are. You can make a small change to that field configuration, even all the way down to changing the name of that pick list value or adding a new level of automation on top of it, like a workflow rule or process builder, or stop me if you've heard this one, you integrate a new piece of software like DocuSign or um, you know, PandaDoc, or like I said, SalesLoft or mm -hmm. Outreach, any of these that communicate with Salesforce, they make decisions based on that one field. And so now you've made that one field change or that change to the dynamic of that field that have big ripple effects. And I think the sellers here will all agree with this. They've all tried to even mark an opportunity as closed one and they get that error message and it's the last day of the quarter and they can't get their deal closed and then therefore it's not going to count for them and you know they're not going to get their commission and therefore they're not going to buy diapers for the baby and so on and so on. So yeah. um, these these do these changes do create bottlenecks in the way we operate our business. Um, now, tactically and, and even financially, uh, think about financial burdens and impacts, you can make those same changes and billing in your finance department isn't going to know when and how or be able to invoice the right person because all of this is being driven off of metadata, right? But mm -hmm. I think the uh, the classic one is really going to be from uh, the marketing side. You start to think there's, there's four really important fields that, that marketers need uh, most of the time, and it's first name, last name, email, and title. Uh, you can add the fifth one in their company name, but you ask any marketer, that's not going to stop them from, from marketing to them, but it's going to be nice to know. That's well, right. You think about it. Think about any of your standard lead forms on a website. Again, just call those five fields out. The minute you add those to your lead form and you don't know all the underlying automation behind the scenes that's also using those fields, uh, a lot of demand gen managers will tell you this. Uh, 
man, it looks like something broke on our, on our inbound form or we haven't had any inbounds in a week and a half uh-huh. and not necessarily the case. Somebody's trying to go to your website and probably put that information in and it might be going in somewhere, but it's not making its way all the way down to Salesforce because of a validation rule or it is making its way all the way down there, but it's meeting another criteria and it's automatically getting lead round Robin to an inactive user. These are common <laughs> stories that a lot yeah. of marketing ops folks and sales ops folks will tell you, but that's dollars on the table. Like if, if those things aren't going the right way and you've missed 10, 20, 30 inbounds, whatever your conversion rate is, as long as your conversion rate's not zero, you're objectively leaving money on the table by not seeing those come through and getting those assigned the right way. Yeah. So, um, so sonar gives you change intelligence and it gives you the ability to make changes and know what the impact downstream is. Right. Tell us about, um, you know, how would somebody who has sonar then, uh, make that, um, make that change to the opportunity pick list on a uh, closed lost reason. And h- how would they, how would a uh, sonar change how they, uh, make that change? So yeah. to speak. Yeah. So yeah, of course. So there's two, there's two real good ways to think about this. Uh, you can do things just in life generally as well, proactively or reactively. We're always going to suggest proactively checking sonar to make sure that whatever change you're about to go make to, let's call it opportunity stage. The first thing you need to do is check Sonar to see where exactly this is being used, how it's being used, who else is using it. Um, A lot of that comes down to the the systems themselves. Opportunity stage is used in almost every go-to-market piece of technology. Kind of hard to argue that it's not. And if you're not having the right channels of communication with the folks who own Marketo, for instance, and you see that inside Sonar, that, hey, look at that, opportunity stage is being used in Marketo, good chance you're going to go make that change that that works for you, but you don't know if it works for them and you don't know if that change is going to get communicated correctly to them or not. And so that's how the the collaboration side of this really starts to play in. Um, By using the platform, you get to see not only all of those dependencies, but you get to see who else is owning that and using it. Your your gain site admin might be using that in a totally different way. And if you end up making that change, the last thing you want to do is put them in a bad spot and you make the change and it breaks their integration. You just wrecked their entire next day because they're not going to be able to do their normal job. They're going to be untangling the web that you've created. Mm-hmm. Um, so we always suggest proactively, please, please, please proactively go and, and check and make sure um, you know what these changes could, could make. But also we get it. We all work fast, myself included. I'm notoriously bad at uh, or was in the past from an operation standpoint, just go in, make the change. We always call it, put your cowboy hat on and see what happens. <laughs> um, I was terribly notorious for it. And so on a reactive side, we have your back as well. Uh, because our integration syncs on a daily basis, we're able to tell you the changes that were made yesterday or just between syncs for that matter. And by doing that, we're going to let you know, hey, by the way, this changed yesterday. Um might want to check it out before it really impacts end users as well. And we get that over to you in an email summary every day. Um, common, common use case for that. And a lot of times we educate our customers this way. Uh, you know, people always ask, well, yeah, but, but how would I use that? How many data loads are you doing per day, per week, per month? I'm, I'm sure at least it's one. So as long as you're doing mm-hmm. one, it's relevant. Um, in order to do data loads the right way, you have to deactivate a lot of automations so that the data load will actually go into Salesforce. Dude, I was notoriously bad for this. I would go and deactivate all the validation rules and I'd do my data load. And I'm like, yes, successful data load. I'm done. And <laughs> I forget to reactivate everything. Um, and the the downstream implication, that's huge. One of those being like a closed loss validation rule. The minute you deactivate that and forget to reactivate it, 10 users might have already closed opportunities and they didn't get hit with the, hey, why did you lose this opportunity? And you're CRO at the end of the quarter is going to run that report and be like, huh, we only lost four deals this whole quarter to timing. That was weird. No, you lost a lot of deals to it, but you mm. weren't, we didn't guide your user to fill the data in the right way. So, uh, yeah. proactive and reactive is the way and we that leads to, it. and that leads to a bunch of bad decisions by the CRO. So all, all kinds of, uh, downstream impacts. What, one of the things that uh, Sonar reminds me of is how, um, on the engineering side, software teams go through a really, uh, detailed QA process before they ever launch a, uh, or update the production environment. Right. And almost sonar almost allows RevOps teams to do the same when they're making a change. And it, one of the things we always talk about at scale matters is how, uh, yours, IT teams or 
are so good at uh, thinking about what data model they need, what technology they need to support the data model, and then building that uh, architectural framework. On the sales marketing side, only now do we have RevOps teams that are uh, taking the lead in doing that. Previously, it was just like, let's start selling and put up websites, and then we'll fill in the data requirements and technology needs on the back end. Causes a huge headache. And um, so I think by bringing that engineering architectural mentality over to RevOps and using tools like, like Sonar, it's going to help avoid a lot of the data problems and data integrity issues and waste issues that you guys talk about on your website. Uh, you talk about 49% of businesses say that their systems don't integrate. I mean, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. That should not be the case in 2021 and, and any year after this. The tools yeah. are out there to solve it. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll double click into it real quick because you, you mentioned um, how like IT departments in the software engineering world has, has essentially solved for some of this. You're right. A lot of it comes down to methodology. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Jack, my, my co-founder, is our chief product officer. His entire background has almost exclusively been in product and engineering. And so he's familiar with running two-week sprints and going through a QA process and pushing from, from dev to staging and staging to, to production. And the very first time, Dan, I told Jack uh, some of the problems I was having, because Jack and I have worked together for two other companies now. This is the third one that we've worked, uh, worked together. Obviously, the first one we started together. Uh -huh. But when I was describing some of the problems I was running into, he even mentioned the same thing that you were saying. It's like, this is weird. We've, we've solved for this from a methodology standpoint, but we've also solved for this from a technology standpoint. Like, we have amazing systems that our engineering teams think, like, think GitHub. Like, of course, almost uh -huh. everyone uses GitHub from a coding perspective and looking at the version control and collaboration side, then, you know, operations folks don't really have that. Yeah. We have a little bit of sandbox to production, but we don't have a way to collaborate yeah, yeah. and communicate, which is one of the things we're solving for. Same thing. He's like, no, if things go off the rails and if things break, we have pager duty. We, we understand when we have issues that pop up, I've got a software that helps me solve for that. Um, how do systems integrate and all of our, our engineering tech stack work? Oh, well, we've got uh, you know, Datadog to help us understand all these API endpoints and how things integrate. And one of the first times he told me all that, I was like, man, that's that's really cute. I, I, I can't really use any of those. One, I'm not a developer. Like my background doesn't afford me that. Two, most of these don't actually work with the technology that I'm working with. So when we look at the problems we're solving. We're not reinventing the wheel. We're, we're putting new methodology into how a phenomenal group on the other side of the fence, our engineering team, uh, has been using this for years. We're just bringing some of those principles and best practice to, uh, to the forefront. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Uh, let's, let's keep going here. I want to get into, and, and this is something I like to get into with all our, uh, our guests on the show is the, the appropriate structure for the RevOps function. And I, you know, I, I've heard all, uh, all kinds of opinions on this, but I'd love to hear your opinion on, first of all, we'll kick it off with, uh, on one hand, you have the model of having a sales ops group, marketing ops group, and a success ops group, uh, all separate inside an organization. And on the other side, you have the belief that a rev ops should be one centrally um, located group, and it, those folks should all be working together and have visibility across, the, across all teams, across the whole organization. I'd love to hear your view and maybe take us back if you if you want to go through the history of RevOps and and what's your view should it be separate should it be one yeah um all pun intended that's a billion dollar question mm -hmm, um, and, mm -hmm. and and I hate to give the blanket answer of it depends but it, it truly does um but here's why and, and even in my evolution of doing this um I very much started in that 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 pendulum swing of starting in sales ops I actually started in professional services operations believe it or not working in a mm -hmm. consulting firm um, but from a siloed perspective, my career started in silos and then obviously has evolved into revenue operations, especially most recently before starting Sonar was running a RevOps team at, at Terminus. And when I say it depends on the company, it really depends on the business model you're running and, and if you really need sort of an umbrella of support to help with all the go-to-market teams. Um, an interesting conversation I was having the other day, like even some like PLG-based companies might not need a full on um, siloed operations group because some of it's kind of automated. Like when you think of the front side of like PLG companies, like you've, you've got your um, your free user side, your freemium model, or you've got your mm -hmm. free dip or your free uh, trial that you spin up all on your own. Um, but you really need all that support more like kind of post sale or you know, sales assisted and then into customer success. So 
might not need as much marketing operations support as a different company who has longer sales cycles and they're very strategic about how they go after uh, a, a portion of their uh, of their prospects or they have a smaller TAM that they have to be very, very cognizant of how to go market to. They might need different support levels and therefore you could have a better siloed opportunity there than an overall umbrella perspective. But um, yeah, it's funny when you think of how these things should really be like folded up. I, I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm going to have to defer to the fact of like you as a business need to know what your pain points are. It's just like my technology. If we're going to make a fundamental shift to the way that we operate our business, let's go figure out the pain points that are causing them. But mm -hmm. ob objectively, some of the biggest benefits of doing a more unified operations approach like RevOps is higher data consistency and data quality. Um, when you have one group managing and governing how data is being orchestrated through these technology systems, uh, you're going to make less biased decisions. Um, better said, if you truly are embracing like a RevOps model, you're not going to make a decision for the marketing team that could fully uh, hinder or mess up a, a, how the sales team is using that same piece of data. Things like uh, total contract value, just as a, mm -hmm. as a random example, um, you know, if marketing is going to make a decision on how something gets calculated, it should be thought of that. All right. Well, how does this impact sales? How does this impact customer success? Who more importantly, how does this in, impact finance? Cause they're going to mm -hmm. bill for all this yeah. stuff. And so, um, those are the decisions that you need to start thinking about when you're making these. And if it's better to have, you know, again, removing that bias and making it so that we're making the, the right decisions for the company, not just for the right team. Um, but yeah, it's going to come down to your business itself and, how you feel like it's going to drive a better impact. Yeah. Does, does one RevOps team mean you have to have a, um, you know, marketing automation specialist type of, uh, person in RevOps and then a uh, customer success, uh, software specialist in RevOps. You can't just have Salesforce admins as your RevOps leaders. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So this, this is the interesting fold of it because, I think what we're seeing now in this, uh, again, this RevOps, we call it revolution, if you will, that we're seeing over mm -hmm. the last three, four, five years. And we're here we for increased it. Them. Yeah, oh, dude, we're here for it. Let's ride the wave, yeah, man. Yeah. Um, but, but what you're seeing is a lot of folks trying to make the right decisions. My personal way of thinking about it is um, don't mask RevOps just by giving it a new name and still having silos underneath it. I, I, we actually have talked to uh, companies that, We'll say like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm the director of RevOps. Like, cool, how's your team structured? Oh, well, I've got a RevOps manager for sales. I've got a RevOps manager for marketing. And I got a RevOps manager for success. I'm like, what, what's your job? Like, why? <laughs> you're just leading these people. I get it. But like, you're not really eliminating these silos because you still have resources that potentially have a bias towards like a specific group. Mm -hmm. um, the, the way I've always thought about suggesting it is break these down more into principles or focus areas. Uh, you should have a, you know, a RevOps manager and, and forget all the different titles. I've never really been title oriented or driven to be quite honest, but you might have a RevOps resource in charge of systems, like just straight business systems. And that's going to be more of your like Salesforce admin. The person is rolling their sleeves up, making some of these configuration changes could have one person that's fully focused on data. And you start to think about the skill set that's involved with that that is more geared towards your, your BI person, somebody that's going to be using some of these go-to-market systems, maybe layering in a Tableau or a Looker and understanding some of the business mechanics and trends that we're seeing. And then third, you could have a vein all to itself that we're somewhat seeing already named uh, you know, sales enablement, but think of uh, go-to-market enablement or RevOps enablement because that person is just as important to make sure that, hey, the systems person made all these cool changes in sales loft and Salesforce, but who's going to train them? Who's going to make mm -hmm. sure that not only the SDRs are using it the right way, but also the AEs and maybe even the CSMs? Are we training and enabling these people the right way? So you could have somebody enablement and process uh, yeah. that helps govern making the sure, usage of this stuff. Making sure marketing is creating the forms of the right hidden fields and uh, automations and Marketo or HubSpot pro properly. That's another training area that often gets uh, forgotten about. Yeah, I, I Absolutely. like that. And then... Um, you know, often RevOps people, uh, even admins, spend a lot of their time doing tactical stuff, prepping reports, supporting, I don't want to use the term inept, but supporting salespeople <laughs> who are struggling. <laughs> um, what advice do you have for people who are kind of stuck in the 
the tactical task grind? What, what, what are the keys to moving into more of a strategic type of work? I think there's an opening for it in RevOps. There is. Uh, well, I think one of the first underlying uh, things that you have to get really good at, just one of the principles you need to kind of engrave in your own head is uh, the ability to say no. And I think this is a little bit of a kind of a double-edged sword in that RevOps folks inherently want to say yes. Like, oh, you have a problem? Yes, I can help fix that. Like, that, that's great. Um, and I don't want anybody to take this out of context and just start saying, actually, no, just start saying no instead of yes. Uh, maybe you say why a few times instead of yes. Take a principle and a play out of the, the product manager's playbook and ask why three times. But what you'll quickly realize, and you talked about tactical versus strategic, I'll put a pin in that and I'm going to come right back to it. But what you'll quickly realize is that because you're looked at as the fixer and the person that knows how these systems work and know the processes behind them and how they drive the data, all three of the big core pillars in RevOps, you're going to be asked a lot of questions. And sometimes, Dan, to your point, it could be somebody that might be a little inept or doesn't know how to do it or doesn't know how to use the systems the right way. And so you have to spend time on them. But there's a lot of times that you're going to get asked a question that you don't really need to go make a system change to. You probably just need to go have a conversation about and really think critically about why and how we want to go make that change. But, uh, but just at the, at the surface of it from a tactical versus strategic standpoint, we ask our, our customers and prospects this all the time. It's one of our, actually one of our qualifying questions as we're talking to groups. If you had to look at yourself I mean, just in one day, um, draw a big circle on a whiteboard, I mean, here's your pie chart. How would you break up your segments in tactical versus strategic in regards to how much time you spend on a daily basis being tactical and strategic? They're like, oh, Brad, are you kidding me? 80%, 90% of my time is tactical. I'm, I'm putting out fires. I'm you know, building this report here. I'm making this change here. But you know, orchestrating all these systems is really time consuming. And so I'm, I'm constantly tactical and not nearly as much time being strategic where I'm, I'm heads down, headphones in. You know, grinding through some data and trying to figure out some new trends and stuff. And I was like, cool. Well, I'm sorry. I've been there, by the way. That's a tragic place to be, but I've walked that mile, so I can definitely empathize with you. But yeah. we double-click one time into the tactical side. And this is the this is the this kind of the aha moment sometimes. Like, cool. Well, you're telling me you spend 80% of your time being tactical. How much of that tactical bucket now is proactive versus reactive because there's this proactive uh, tactical stuff we have to do, right? Like we have to go implement new software. That's a proactive uh, tactical thing, but they're like, Oh, that's a good one. Oh, almost that entire bucket is reactive. It's people coming and standing on my desk because they can't get a quote out the door to get assigned or like DocuSign's messing up and it's not going to get my signature through or, Hey Brad, this new lead's not converting the right way. What's going on in Salesforce. And so the better you understand your tech, and the better you have a blueprint for it and the, really the way that you can orchestrate the right way and have all the right mechanical parts in place, the more proactive you get to be because you don't have to be nearly as reactive. And when you get to be more proactive, that bigger pie chart wedge starts to shift. and You really get to start being more strategic and you get to be backpedaling and tactical the whole time. So, um, yeah, the pie chart example, I, we absolutely love it. And every time we ask customers, it's, it's a pretty unified question. Nobody has ever come to me and said, coolest thing man i get to be 100 percent strategic the whole time i don't have to worry about tactical stuff i was like well i'm probably talking to the wrong person <laughs> <So>. <laughs> that's awesome i love that might uh, have to steal that question that's a good one um proactive versus reactive so um uh, okay next question and i you know i've seen i've asked this question to a lot of folks and i say where should revops report to and i hear cro cfo VP sales, sometimes the CEO. I even heard um, CTO recently. So where does Brad think that uh, RevOps should report to you? And why don't we start with where it reports to at Sonar, and then um, if you were giving advice to other companies that were similar to Sonar, similar stage, similar type of go-to-market, uh, what would you advise them to, to do in terms of the reporting structure? Yeah, so interestingly enough, here at Sonar, it actually reports in through sales um, with, a, with a little bit of an asterisk by the end of that answer. Um, it's a shared resource and it's a shared responsibility here at Sonar. Candidly, we're probably a little unique to this. We have a lot of folks that are very geared towards the RevOps world. We're yeah. RevOps software. Can right? imagine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I'll tell you this. 
there are actually three people uh, inside the walls that, that we look at as our RevOps team. Um, two of them are sales engineers. Um, and the third one is one of our product managers who was a previous sales engineer. Um, there's a couple of reasons behind this for us. And again, we're probably uh, atypical to this. Um, unless yeah. you're uh, in the same exact software world as we are, it might not actually fit for you. But uh, the cool part between our two sales engineers, we want them to own our go-to-market tech stack and be able to speak very, very confidently to that. Well, why would we ever want that? They're also on the phone with a lot of our prospects and customers, and they're the ones that are saying, oh, well, this is how we use Sonar internally. And this is how I think about this system integrating with this one, because I'm not just giving you lip service. I actually also build and manage that in, in-house. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's very, very important for practitioners to have a story to tell about this. And so our, uh, yeah, our, sales, our two sales engineers internally own the tech stack. Um, but again, there's that third person who's our product manager. Why is it important for him to even come close to thinking about our go-to-market tech stack? Well, he should be almost just as familiar, if not more, with how all these systems are evolving and working so that we can build a better product for our customers. If he doesn't know some of the most recent enhancements that Zoom Info pushed out and how it's impacting Salesforce orgs, he's not going to go be able to build a better feature in Sonar to help mitigate that in the future. So we want our, our team, our RevOps team, to have their eyes and ears on the ground and keep their sleeves rolled up in how, that we, in how we build all this go-to-market technology. Um, now, to answer your second part of that question, who, in my genuine opinion, uh, should this report into? <clears throat> I'm not going to give it the, the candid. It depends. I honestly have reported in my career, I've reported to CEO, CRO, and CFO, at one uh-huh. point VP of sales as well. So oh, the common den- okay. yeah, the common denominator there is going to also say sales, but I think it's going to be anyone who's driving the most impact into the business as far as adoption, uh, direction, and just overall strategy for a couple of reasons, but one no bigger than the other is that if this person who, again, and I'm going to be bullish and stand on my soapbox about it, they are integral and they are so important to the health and the, the wellness of how a company runs whoever is helping drive and dictate a lot of the strategy and the way that those decisions are made, I want them tied to the hip. Now, I don't care if it's a direct line or a dotted line. If that's the CEO and that CEO is still very tactical and keeps their sleeves Mm -hmm. rolled up, man, that person's going to be their best friend because they're going to make sure that everything gets done the right way and that strategy comes top down. Um, This goes back to like who who CEOs are sometimes and and what background do they have. If that CEO is more of like the engineering background, might not be the right person. You might have a phenomenal CRO that is so in tune to how go-to-market technology works and how we should be making this strategy. Now's the right time for us to implement territory modeling. That's who you want to help make those decisions because your RevOps resource, whoever it is, you know, analyst, manager, director, VP, uh, doesn't necessarily matter their title. If they are tied to the hip to the person who gets to help make those decisions, those decisions get made faster with more confidence as well as they get executed to a T and you got executive buy-in right there. So however that works in your organization, you know, I'd look there first. Yeah. It may be the COO slash president too. Uh, it's another role that often takes on that, um, that job of being the strategic one who's really leading the day-to-day operations, uh, the go-to-market. So that's, that's, I love that answer. Um, I haven't heard one quite like that. And, but I think it's spot on because, um, I know our, our CEO, Scott, uh, I worked with him at a previous company. He was very intricately involved in a day to day and, and Vinny, uh, our other co-founder at scale matters, he reported straight to Scott because, um, it was just the best reporting structure for the, their organization at that time. Um, and later he reported to the chief operating officer. And then, um, you know, if we still were still there and we had a CRO probably would have switched to that person. So yeah, that, uh, that makes complete sense. And, and I related to this is the, uh, the role of analysts, I wanted to ask you about that. So like you can call it a go-to-market analyst, sales and marketing analyst, ops analyst. They have different titles, but I think that's a growing role as well. Uh, it could be a subset of RevOps, but some, in some organizations, they report directly to finance. Do you guys have a uh, an analyst on the go-to-market side? And, and if so, where do they fall in the organization? So we don't have a dedicated analyst. That's what you call uh, on our go-to-market like a business side. business analyst, mar- yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. When you start to think of like BI side of things uh, yeah. and true, like let's go see trends and analysis. Uh, we well, maybe we do. Maybe you're you're talking to them right now. That's that's still a lot of the role uh-huh. that I, uh-huh. I play. I, I just like being so ingrained in the metrics and the numbers and how our business is truly operating. Now, sadly, I'll probably grow out of that role at, at some point, probably sooner than later. But um, I we don't have one dedicated here. However, I would say it is so important to invest in that early compared to uh, later or be backpedaling. And I think it's synonymous with how you think about um, revenue operations as well. If, if you just, if you take one step back and you look at all the different systems we have and all the different data points we're collecting and you compare that to what B2B SaaS was doing 10 years ago, five years ago, even the number of data points and now the way you can use those data points has exponentially grown. And I think it's always going to be of a principal mindset. Would you rather solve for a fire that is massively burning or solve to prevent a fire from ever happening? So much of it, even in the early days of, of sonar and the early days of scale matter, any company, I think, the earlier you solve the story your data can tell you, the better. And so if you're listening to this and you're like, man, we're a hundred person company and I'm about to pull the, I was thinking about getting a, a business analyst to really keep mm-hmm. their eye on the data trends and, and moving parts. I don't know if we can afford it yet. Maybe I'll wait for two more quarters. Do it. it, it yeah. was not, it's not going to hurt you. You'd rather get ahead of it because you don't want to be that 200 person company or 300 person company that has been around for now five, six, seven years and can't make any sense of the historical data behind mm-hmm. you because it's moved, evolved, changed. There's no trends that you can capture out of it. Um, invest in it early and start using, you know, th- these are great systems you can use like between Tableau and Looker. And there's a, a ton of different, um, you know, now systems that sit on top of like segment census, things like that. Those help you make better business decisions, especially with the massive amount of data we all are subject to now. Wow. That's crazy. I, our, uh, Scott just, uh, he sent me a text the other night uh, it was late at night and he was like, man, I wonder if, um, he's like, I'm thinking about business analysts might be the hire before you hire a head of revenue operations, simply because of what you just said, that getting your data model and the thinking about all the data that you need to make decisions should come first before you put the technology into place, which is what RevOps often owns. So uh, that's super interesting that you're kind of, um, synergistic in how you think about that. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, and I, I should have, I should be the one asking you this <laughs> from a scale matter perspective. I know from a, a KPI and data and understanding how your business is operating and how you should be interpreting some of the trends that you're seeing. I, I know you, you guys help so much with some of your customers and understanding their data in a more holistic way. So I'd, I'd probably, yeah, I agree completely with Scott. I mean, I think uh, if you're building your RevOps team out and you're thinking about the importance of your data, I would challenge anyone to think about it in this context. Go look at how much money you're spending on your go-to-market technology. And therefore, go think about all the money you're spending on your marketing strategy. Go think about all the money you're spending on your customer success strategy. You're only going to be able to make decisions for all those departments with high-quality data that you have a high degree of confidence in. But man, if you have a low degree of confidence in it, you feel like that spreadsheet that somebody's been working in for five days is, you know, bubble gum and toothpick together, you're not going to feel real good about walking into that next board meeting, which again, you, you, you pay for it in one way or the other. You're going to pay for it in technology. You're going to pay for it in people. But I would, I would always highly suggest get a handle on it. And if you can see a fire burning from a mile away, grab the fire extinguisher now. Don't wait till you get to the fire mm-hmm. to try to put it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, all right. One last question for you, Brad. Should the RevOps leader at a, at an organization have a spot at the executive table? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, hands down, yes. Because without them at that table, we've all been there. We've been in board meeting situations. And stop me if you've heard it before, but you, know, you start the whole meeting off and marketing goes first. You're like, man, we had a great quarter. We put up you know, $10 million in new pipeline. It was great. And they passed the baton to the sales leader. And they're like, 10 million? I only saw, I only saw 8 million come through to us, but that's okay. We don't, we closed 4 million of that. So it's, it's been great. And then they pass it over to success. And like, you guys didn't close 4 million in new business. You only closed three, but that's okay. Cause we retained hundred percent of it. We grew it by 10%. Then all of a sudden you look down at the other end of the table and the, you know, the CEO and the CFO just have their hands in their face, just like shaking their head. Like, why don't we have our data aligned? 
So yeah, yeah absolutely. Get ahead of it. Put RevOps at the table and, and a lot of that gets solved. Yeah. Let's hope a uh, board member is not at that meeting too. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They, they really are the, I think you said this previously, they're the eyes and ears uh, and they know all the moving parts, all the levers. And, um, you know, even they're the first ones to know that a new sales cohort is going to be hired. They're the first people to know when someone's going to get let go. They know everything at a tactical level and, and often a strategic level. So get, uh, get your RevOps person at the executive table. Um, you, you will not regret it, Brad, really appreciate your time today. It's been an awesome conversation. Um, and why don't you tell the audience uh, where they can find more information about Sonar and, and how they can keep up with you during the day. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Dan. I can, you know, I can go on about this all day, every day. This is uh, one of those passionate topics we have. But yeah, if you want to learn more about Sonar, obviously find me on LinkedIn or on uh, follow Sonar on LinkedIn. But our website is csonar, S-E-E-S-O-N-A-R dot com, uh, as well as for those folks that are looking to get into the operations world or have been there for 10 plus years. Um, please check out our community. Uh, like Dan mentioned, a lot of the Scale Matters team is in WizOps as well wizops.org find me find wizops on linkedin uh but please uh if for anything else you want some funny funny laughs throughout the day and get some great memes going on uh the, the meme game is strong in wizops so uh <laughs> yeah give us a follow in both places appreciate it brad Ho hope you guys have an awesome uh, rest of the quarter and we'll catch up down the road fantastic dan thank you too man appreciate it right. thanks